Welcome to week 10. It's time to talk about community and collaboration. So at this point in the season, well now, it's really close to assessment season. The marketing performance review is headed inbound at pace. You are finalizing aspects of your class participation and you've got a couple of things to report in on for the ePortfolio. Now, two things I want to draw your attention to with regards to this content and your current materials. First of all, any of you who built a community-oriented project, there's some material in tonight that is about this particular aspect. So if there was a value proposition that was followers, you know, your game plan was to increase your number of followers or to get likes or to get comments or any of the sort of participatory, I'm going to need people around me, therefore I'm going to want to drive community to create value for being engaged. Those aspects in the reflection, both in your reflection of the portfolio and in your e-performance review for how the project went. There'll be material in this slide deck of value to you. Secondly, for everyone, if you have been a participant in our subject experience, if you've been in our forums and you've used our Padlet, you've been part of a community. And what I'm wanting to do with this theoretical concepts, which could be very abstract and very sort of, well, frankly, they could be very surreal. They could be very easy to turn around into high level conceptual discussions but we've lived an experience and we've had a reality that bears witness to the theory. So I want to make certain that when you are thinking about this in terms of your ePortfolio review, you do consider that the theories we're going to, and the content and the ideas we're going to talk about in this series, this episode, will link back to your experience inside the e-marketing subject. Also, a big shout out to um, XKCD's content, which have been keeping me going. Uh, I've added these in, in no small part for myself, but also because XKCD is an interesting example of a, an artist who created something with no intention of creating a community and ended up with a community he had no, no intention of creating. But also the way that there's usually something, there's a piece of content in there that sort of resonates and becomes like a banner for the community. And uh, also the shout outs to every consultancy out there who's played both sides of the fence uh, over the years. Now, quick little historical footnote. The first time I published a piece of work on online community was 1998. I use the word cyber. Yes, we said cyber communing uh, because basically that's what you said back in the 90s. You said the word cyber. You legitimately said uh, you know, cyberspace was a place. Uh, cyber community was a thing that took place when people gathered in cyber spaces to have cyber relationships. No, cyber had a different meaning. Uh, they, basically, the whole idea was 98 that's the first time I had a paper published on this area. I've been part of a cyber and online community uh, since 95. Now I took the personal experiences and the theoretical frameworks, we combined them together and got a paper out in 98. So it's been a long time uh, and it's been a long road of experiences and other aspects involved in this whole thing that brings to some of the theories and some of the practices I talk about here. But basically the, uh, the notion of a, an online community, what makes it valuable is membership of the community gives a sense of belonging and membership of the community gives access to other people. Community can form anywhere. Anywhere that there is an opportunity for a one person to talk to other people and other people to feel that there is an in-group and an out-group, then there is a community. Merely owning a social media account doesn't make a community. Having a Twitter account doesn't mean you've got a community if you don't have engagement. 
Same way, you can have a community under a Flickr photo because there's a infrastructure capacity for it and you can have an Instagram account with no community because no one engages, there's no crosstalk, it's only unilateral and this is something I think is really important to understand is that unilateral engagement, parasocial engagement follower to content creator that isn't community community is follower to other follower follower to fellow follower it's it's the C to C, the C to C drives it now there are some key trigger events that create things uh, the esteemed Dr. Tony Egar has a PhD's worth of elements talking about the notion of brand communities and the work that she's done in this area is incredible and I say this both as the person who had to read many early drafts of the ideas and learn a lot about brand community and community engagement and how people have built identity through affiliation to you know they are affiliates of a particular brand a particular identity a particular lifestyle but there are a couple of th like the theoretical frameworks done the pin that are things like connection to celebrity or the outgroup identification people not like me versus people who are like me parasocial relationships which have been a driving part of some of our design tech around online teaching and learning the one-to-many-to-one -to -one communication that uh, Hoffman and Novak brought into play way back in the late 90s and the Rheingold shared goods of value all these elements are they intermesh they are component parts not all need to be present for it to work but the more of these components that are the more of these component elements that are present the easier it is for the community to create the shared value that forms and reinforces their community. So C to C, customer to customer communication is vital. You need a one to many to one framework. So communication between members of the community is visible to the community. And you need there to be a driving value, something presence, mere presence alone is not enough. It's value in use. Being part of and participating in creates the value that keeps the community rolling. So that's how value is created, but the question you ask yourself is what is the value offer of membership of a community? And that's an open-ended one. That's something that's really interesting. Now, as a consumer, your value proposition is going to come from the use you gain or the elements you gain. One thing I will say as a marketer is if you're ever tasked with oh, build a brand community, build a community. Why, we've got customers, have a community of them. Run. Run far away. Or at least turn around and say, look, what is the end goal? What do you want? Do you want to increase sales? Do you want to increase brand loyalty? Are you, look, what is the purpose of the community? Don't accept a task of create a community. You need a task definition that is, what is my, what does my community contribute back to the overall overarching goals and objectives of the organization? Case in point, I was asked for a number of years ago now, the College of Business and Economics wanted to set up a series of communities online communities and forums and I said well what is our purpose why why are we doing this what do we want out of it and no one could give me a clear answer no one could give me a statement we and I said look this is the problem we're artificially layering in an infrastructure saying students commune and that doesn't work if there is a goal and a purpose to the community that the community can attain then there is something of value that creates the value offer that drives affiliation shared experience and identity 
On the other side is uh, I have been tasked with creating an enhancing community experience uh, for two major national organisations and because I was able to say, well, our purpose is retention of customer. Our purpose is to create a sense of community so people feel connected to others and feel it's worth that they are recognised as participants within an overarching environment, even if they don't participate. And that's how I've run two uh, newsletters, one for a global institution, one for a national institution. By constantly using the language of shared goods of value and say, thanking people for, oh, I'd like to thank the contributors for their suggestions this week and I'd like to thank the subscribers by recognizing affiliation, contributors and subscribers, by having a particular identity for them. Uh, for our LEGO Serious Play community, it's BrickMind, BrickMind community, hashtag BrickMind. That creates identity, creates affiliation, and that makes it easier then to create a sense of shared experience. And if you think it sounds manipulative, look, it's not so much a case of manipulation as a case of without these parts, you can go to a gym for a thousand days in a row and not be a member of the community. Because if you don't interact with the other people, there's nothing. All right, let's talk price, uh, access and exchange for data, community, Twitter, uh, Twitter's not bad at community, it's just bad at community. It's a case of if you follow the, if you curate your following and pay attention to the fact that you have consciously chosen to have these people as part of your feed, it can be a completely non-community environment. But if you then consciously choose to engage and you get engagement back, then you are building a sense of community that I am part of something bigger. Uh, Twitter was never designed as a community platform either. It is a broadcast platform. Uh, it's an SMS platform that got a bit big and expanded. You can create community there. Freemium, the Facebook. Facebook's... Look, Facebook was a nasty piece of work when it started. It was designed to rank the sexual attractiveness of female college students at the college where the creepy bastard who runs it was located. So it starts from a very super creepy origin point. Tragically, that super creepy origin point clearly had enough shared goods of value to, rather than this man living a life of permanent rejection and exile on a desert island for being overtly creepy, it built up enough that they were um, able to spin it out beyond uh, its original university, college, student-only origin. It does have mechanisms on board that facilitate community, Although at the moment its strength, Facebook's real strength, is in the destruction of communities by cr using shared outrage points. Which is annoying because it was, look, for a brief period of time, Facebook actually was quite good at connecting people to people. And then their engineering division decided to destroy it rather than see it as valuable because they couldn't figure out how to monetize it. The answer was, let people give them money. Let people pay money. That's how you monetize something. Same for our uh, advertisers, advertiser interrupters. I always maintain, don't use advertising in community. If you have set up a community, particularly if you've set up a brand community, people will talk about your brand because they like your brand. The existence of the adult, uh, adult fans of LEGO, the AFOLs, they have many, many community points. And they're super excited by LEGO, so they talk about LEGO. LEGO doesn't need to run adverts in the AFOL community because the AFOL community is a word of mouth endorsement of LEGO. And thankfully, LEGO's mostly got it right. Mostly, they've got the hang of that. They're like, they're quite hands off. Uh, other areas are less hands-off, they're more interrupters, and so 
you don't want to, particularly one of the things, the biggest thing that can kill a community is if your community infrastructure puts a barrier between you interacting with other people unless you clear a paid advert that will destroy the value of the community and waste the advertiser's dollar. Other places are where money comes into it. Now, Live Journal was really interesting before the Russians bought it. Uh, before the great strike through and the great strike out, uh, the mass censoring of slash fiction uh, and the general taking a very good product and then suddenly deciding to take find all the things people valued about it and smash them with a hammer. Life Journal was a very vibrant place that promoted a lot of communities of interest. And it was very easy to join a Life Journal community and have a linear a linear feed of both your friends' posts and your journal your uh, journal communities that you joined. So what the way they monetized is you bought added on features that enhanced your own experience or gave you the capacity to give gifts. You could pay money to the software to the host so that you could then give a bunch of pixels to somebody else. So the first place was the premium for the accounts. Uh, the second place, this was amazing. I spent way more money than a sensible professional marketing academic should have spent on buying JPEGs that I could go give to somebody else. That like I you know, we were buying Valentine's Day roses, we were buying Christmas decorations, we were buying Easter eggs, we were buying uh I can't remember which movie it was that came out, but we bought the things to give to our friends because we felt connected to the platform and the platform enabled us to connect to others. So literal shared virtual goods of value. What wrecked it and what ruined LiveJournal is that they went through a change of own, number of changes of ownership and the change of owners went and drove out. The, the mistake they made is they decided that the paying audience was going to be their priority and they would get rid of the unpaid accounts. So you'll note there that there's paid account and unpaid account. What LiveJournal misunderstood was I would pay for an account that gave me a whole series of benefits and one of those benefits was I reached an audience of unpaid accounts. So as a you know, number of the authors I knew at the time were putting a lot of money into LiveJournal to have a high-end good production value account which they expected all their followers, they didn't expect their followers to pay money, they didn't want their followers to pay money necessarily, they wanted their access to tens of thousands of people following them. Live Journal came in and said, well, what if we got rid of all the free accounts? And all the people with paid accounts said, well, that's the reason we're here, that's our value proposition, that's a dumb idea, we're leaving. So, between Strike Through, which was a moral panic around... Uh, Mail, mail slash fiction that was being written around. Um, wasn't it? We weren't even at the Marvel movies phase at that point in time. Mostly Lord of the Rings slash fiction. Moral panic on that, and then the desire to absolutely destroy the value proposition. Still out there because these are recent screenshots. But it was one of those things again. You look at it and go, you could have had it all, but you you chose to drive it down. Uh, <coughs> Things that didn't go as badly as expected. Honestly, I say this because when Heels was first launched, it got a very bad response because it, the timing was terrible. Uh, women's wrestling and AEW did not start well, despite the fact that they've gotten this immensely talented roster of incredibly good female wrestlers and four of the best professional wrestlers in the world work in that division. And this is like objectively best in the world class tellers of stories and uh, you know 
Britt Baker and Sheeda and like their feud was okay, but Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa is still one of the best stories ever told in wrestling. Just full stop. At the time that the fan base was saying, can just give us longer matches with the women wrestling, give us better matches, give us more matches. They said, oh, what you mean is you want an elite community for $50 subscription? No, that wasn't what we were asking for. It subsequently, it's gone okay, but um, it's a thing. One of the things about a paid subscription, though, a paid subscription community creates a couple of instant events. One of them is it creates a real-time identity for the people who are involved. Because you are tied to a credit card, you're tied to a financial identity, you have a certain level of behavioral modification that you're not going to engage in risk certain behaviours that would be high risk if your account was disposable. Or rather, because your account is tied to your identity and not disposable, it is a higher risk proposition to engage in certain behaviours. It's not perfect, but it's higher. Which brings us down to non-financial price. Uh, every community is different, therefore everything ranges. The biggest thing I will say is communities take time. As a moderator of a community, and as someone who, uh, when I was one of the writers for GirlWonder.org, uh, feminist comic books website, I was tasked, each week I had uh, two four-hour shifts on the forums. And my job was to have the forum client open during my four-hour shift, where I'd be co-moderating with someone else. We had a chat, a back-channel chat that we would talk to each other, check in, uh, we'd check in on threads, we'd look for behaviours that were outside of our terms of use. It was a day, I committed a day a week to my volunteer uh, job at a community forum. So, as a forum participant, I sunk a lot of time into various forums. As a forum moderator, someone whose job it was as a volunteer to help keep the community running the way we wanted the community to run. So being part of it, there's a time price. The next thing on the list is that there's an effort price. You are going to need to, to really get something out of the community, you've got to put stuff in. Similarly, there are learning curves. Uh, this is something that I'm really conscious of, is the spike in the learning curve of joining a new community is massive. You find yourself, oh, hey, I really like wrestling. I'm going to go join this wrestling forum. And suddenly you're on Squared Circle on uh, Reddit. And next thing you know, you're like, okay, I have life choice regrets about doing this. Because there's a whole bunch of, you know, you post a couple of things and then you get either someone takes you aside and says, hey, newcomer, this is how we do stuff here. Or you cop a lot of, people trying to drive you out to maintain their in-group status. So things can be very high risk in this. So things like your lifestyle, your energy, um, even as I said, you can be an extrovert and driven by community interaction and it's still exhausting. And lastly, the, the full gamut of risk is out there. Everything, every possible risk that could be imagined for any type of product, it's there and in play. Now, distribution. This is a couple of things. Um, in community, you've got the digital intangible. The membership of the community, of a virtual community, is all about the digital intangible. And we go into some of that around things like the Rhine Gold, shared goods of value. The transportable tangible is your, um, where you buy merchandise off the community to make, you know, to wear an affiliation marker. I did pick the Just Dustin channel merchandise because it was one of the weirdest t-shirt designs I could find because this particular YouTube celebrity has a strange sign-off catchphrase that they've somehow managed to spell out in a Scrabble point scoring bonanza that they have on a t-shirt that looks like it was one part high-end Gucci and one part low-end Alpha College, Alpha Kappa Gamma College. So, yeah, distribution, 
wearing your marker of your community uh, whilst out in public. So, theory update patch. At the start of the season, we talked about a bunch of different theories. I want to mention them in the context of community now. First of all, the one to many to one. Social media is not by default instant community. Without an interaction effect, without a... You now, social media is a platform upon which you can build a community, but it does not immediately create community. You need social connectivity. You need to self-identify that I am part of a bigger, a part of a community. You need there to be boundaries. You need to know when people are. You need to know when you're not in the community and when you are in the community. Community itself. Uh, this is something that I've had real like. This is from uh, my marketing text from many years ago. Now, I have absolutely struggled to find these two references again. So I'm literally one of the search terms now. But the plastic people rule. I think. The Brogan's Plastic People Rule and Bray's Internet as Access to Other People. It's a real person on the other end of the keyboard. The problem that has emerged for us is a number of the people who have got up in the morning and gone, I'm going to do evil today. I'm going to harm another person. I'm going to set out to hurt and destroy another human. They know it's a person at the other end of the keyboard and that's their value proposition that they are taking is I get to hurt someone and I get to harm someone because frankly they're serial killers without the courage. Way back, as I said, we're looking two and I just around the emergence of social media. Um, so this is from the 2011 textbook. We were really trying to remind people that they're not simulation exercises. They're not, you know, people at the other end of the keyboard and aren't simulation games. Marketers had a real problem with this. They started just assuming that they're, you know, basically they're treating it like a simulation. They were dehumanizing people. They were not thinking that's a person, not a um, credit card in waiting. So a lot of the stuff I had to talk about around community and community engagement around this time was basically stop treating people like their credit cards and waiting, stop treating them like data sets to be harvested, get back to treating them like humans. The problem we've got now is that we've got a whole generation of people who have realized that the rules are in their favor for them to harm others because there's a gener the generation that came before them said, well, they're just data sets. Humans, the members of this community are replaceable. It doesn't matter if I churn these people out, there'll be other people to replace them. So that's a big problem. That's a problem we haven't, we got to patch society to fix that one on the internet. Because the internet is real and it's a real part of society and society is real and it's part of the internet. So the problems you see of human conduct is a problem of society. Now, the parasocial relationships, this is something where, ah. Oh, God, I hate some of the work that's been done in psychology on this. And it's, look, the pain I'm exhibiting is real. There is a whole genre of psychologists who basically have decided to stake their financial fortune on declaring anybody who likes a celebrity to be somebody they need to treat. I regard that as unethical conduct, personally. But I also see it as a problem because we've had parasocial relationships since we've had relationships. If there are four humans involved and two of them only know the other person by what the other person says and does, that's a parasocial relationship going up that way. But the, the notion of the parasocial relationship is it's a one-sided relationship. It's voluntary. You opt in to thinking that you are connected to the person. It has levels of social attractiveness and social attraction. And it's a sense of connectedness. It's a sense of this person becomes part of your life. And it's really easy to criticize and mock and be nasty about it. But no, no, we're going to be better than that. 
the reason why that person becomes part of your life is for the same reason that you like brands, you associate with communities, you have friends. You, in a parasocial relationship, one of the things is, is it's unilateral. That person hasn't got the opportunity to have a one-way, a one-to-one -one interactive relationship with you. They are doing one-to-many broadcast. You are doing one, you are on the receipt of a one-to-many and by reacting and responding and re-engaging to that person, you create a one-to-many because it's witnessed by others, but you don't have your one-to-one. -one. If the one-to-one, the one-to-many-to-one -one kicks into gear and you actually make the connection, that's where you create a full relationship rather than parasocial relationship, and those are the foundations of community. So parasocial relationships come up in a whole host of places. They are notable on the internet because it's easier to find your people. It's easier to connect to people for whom their life experiences resonate to you because it's a search-driven media. It's easier to connect in a parasocial unilateral way because we call you the audience. And, you know, we have fans, we have fan accounts, we follow people on Instagram. I follow half a dozen professional wrestlers because fundamentally I find them to be interesting people. Do I think I have a relationship connection with them? Nope. Do I like seeing their posts and updates? And do I heart their photos on Instagram? Yep. Because the reason I'm following them is they're really interesting people. So I might, like, having done parasocial relationships as a research area, I'm mindful of it, but also there's a bunch of people on Instagram who know me through my posts, and I know them through their posts. We don't hang out together because we're in different countries and we don't have any other connection other than we see each other's content and we like each other's stuff. And that's good enough. It doesn't have to be more. You don't need everything to be some form of deep, meaningful human connection because what makes us a functioning society are these parasocial connections, these... Uh, high-level fluff conversations, these acknowledging the, and I cannot remember the right word for it, and it's in my Twitter uh, classification paper, but these general conversational things, when you wave hi to someone, the person you always nod to on the way to the bus, the person you wave to in your class, like, hey, hi, you don't know their name, you don't know anything about them, but... You're pleased to see them, they're pleased to see you, you both give the recognition. It's a parent social relationship. Just if you do it on YouTube, it's really more obvious. Now, what makes it work and why I bring this up is that it can go horribly wrong, but anything can go horribly wrong. Functional risk. The Look, one of the parasocial functional risks is that you find out that someone who you admired quite a lot turns out to be a complete jerk. Guys, we have this happen way more often that the bunch of the men that we had respect for turn out to be complete jerks. What you do at that moment is you go, hmm, that person's a jerk. I'm not going to double down my fandom and defend them and their jerkish behavior against everybody. I'm going to go, huh, shame that person what turned out to be a jerk. I'm going to move on with my life and reevaluate where what I know about them now fits into what I think about them. It's vitally important that you go and say, hmm, that's new information, I'm going to take it on board, rather than going, I will defend them because someone has besmirched my parasocial friend. Don't do it, don't do it. Because Again, the reason that happens is the value offer of the influencer, you start getting the connection. The authenticity of an influencer also brings to the sense of they're like me or they like me. A sense, now, we've had this from musicians, poets, sculptors, painters. There are a bunch of people who hung around early England 
going, that Shakespeare guy, he get, oh, he just totally gets my life. Uh, oh, his plays are, you know, you gotta, you got to go to the Globe, you got to see him, mate. He's just, he yeah, absolutely, I don't know how he's made that connection, but he's just, he understands me, he gets me. And then that person has to take off because they're being pursued by a bear. The loyalty, then this is where the problem comes in, where loyalty exceeds the calculative value, uh, where you find yourself digging in and going towards the cult end of the proceedings, uh, that's where it goes wrong. It's okay to be brand loyal to a brand. It's okay to be loyal to the persona. Like, you can be brand loyal to... Yeah, you can be a big fan of James Bucky Buchanan in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but that doesn't mean you've got to then defend absolutely everything Sebastian Stan has ever done or ever will do. That's the going the line too far. Brand loyal to the character, fine. Brand lo a sense of loyalty and affection to the person, okay. A fanatical devotion to that person, no, no. That's that's those are the lines. And the thing with parasocial relationships is. There's a lot of commercial pressure to blur those lines, to find ways to have your fans gift money to you, also known as paid subscriptions and paid products and buy my merch, buy my uh, 8x10 glossies, subscribe to my account, subscribe to my Patreon, subscribe to my paid influencer base. So there is a, like, there's a genuine commercialized risk factor involved. So quick, uh, quick run through the uh, the cases. Look, Star is featured on a number of times. They're here for two reasons. They have a named community, and there's a link in the, your PowerPoint slides to uh, Toby Seagar would have thought of it as a throwaway comment in a video. Uh, he was out doing rock climbing with a bunch of his mates on another channel, and he makes this throwaway comment, and. The comment is, he asked the channel hosts that he's with, he said, well, what are you, what's your community called? You know, what, what, what do we call them? And they don't have a name. And he said, well, yeah, it's, it's one of these things. It's got, to, you know, it's got to sound right. It can't sound awkward. And he has a, bit, a short chat about it, and then they go back to climbing rocks. It resonated because what's in a name? The name becomes part of the brand. It becomes part of the identity. Over on the Stora, it's the Stora Army on the uh, How Ridiculous channel, it's the 44 Club. Uh, here in how community, there's the Shadowhawkers, the Daywalkers, and the Nightstalkers. Names, are, names have power. Be mindful of them. Think about what you, how you describe it. Uh, even the question of, like, Stora calls their group the Stora Army and uses rank insignias in their... Uh, so there's a slightly militaristic element to a professional free-running parkour group. You, you gotta, you gotta think about it. You gotta be careful about it. On the other end of the spectrum, I'd like I've mentioned Reddit a few times. Look, if you are a redditor and you feel that I've had a go at you, do understand the reason I know anything about Reddit is that I've got a Reddit account. <laughs> uh, there are certain things that Redditors are kind of notorious for because it's part of the in-group, out-group. It's part of, their com part of the community drive that makes Reddit a community are certain behaviours that make them a key and distinctive market segment. Pretty much there's just about anything you can find on Reddit, uh, any sort of community that's out there. I've just thrown up the Canberra one just as a quick example. It's easier to form community on Reddit, by the way, than it is on Twitter. Reddit is better. Reddit is really well designed. I, it replaced an entire uh, Usenet, the uh, newsgroup forum protocol. Reddit practically replaced that. So Reddit is absolutely phenomenal. It's one of the most amazing design decisions uh, and it's there's so much about it that's quite incredible 
but the main thing to understand is that it's also not a universal. Like, I can make a joke about a Redditor, but there is no such thing as a Redditor. There are members of the Reddit sub-communities, the subreddits. Each of the subreddits is itself a market segment. And within the market segment, so each Reddit is the overarching market. Within Reddit are the subreddits, which are topic-based forums. They become your markets. So overarching market, you then have your market segments. You then can target into a forum to look for certain types of behavior within that forum that would be your ideal target market <coughs> and your ideal target customers. For the most part, Reddit doesn't take too kindly to people trying to flog things to them. They're not really there to be sold to, but they are a community. There's immense knowledge present in this site that if you know how to use it, uh, we've seen a paper previously where the data was scraped from Reddit to look at music recommendations. So as a community, as a platform, phenomenal. There's just nothing like it out there. As a place where it reflects society with a near perfect uh, mirror, geez, there's bits of that place I wouldn't want to go to, and there's bits of that place that aren't for me. There are subreddits that are just not my market segment, and no sense me going down to that circus tent and asking for the monkeys. Ain't my monkeys, ain't my circus, not my sub forum, not my sub market, not where I would be. And that's what you've got to respect about it, is that it is basically no more, no less a physical... It's a physical location on the internet, It's a and it's not able to be genericized to the extent that we know as marketers, subcategories exist, submarkets exist, and you slice it up, dice it up, and find the people who are your market of interest. All right, theory and application to round it out... Yeah, of course I was going to do parasocial relationships. Um, I find this really interesting. This is the idea of how the celebrity, and celebrity is a really open-ended concept, but how someone could use self-disclosure as a means to create parasocial connectivity. So, time to tell you a little secret. Now, every bone of your alarm bells should have gone off if you've read the screen whilst I've said that. Time not to tell you a secret. It's not even remotely a secret. This course, at the front end, I told you I was going to use the theories and the frameworks. Parasocial connectivity is one of the theoretical frameworks that I make use of to establish between myself as a disembodied voice and talking figurehead to you as my audience I use examples from my life and my practice as a means of self-disclosure to give a sense of connectivity. And also I do it because I know things. I've, I've been around the internet for nearly 30 years. I've, you throw me a, you run a project on a platform, chances are I've either thought about it, known someone who's done it well, or known someone who's stuffed it, or stuffed it myself, or done it moderately okay myself. I use self-disclosure to give contextualization to theoretical frameworks that would otherwise be frankly meaningless. I use every example that I have given in this course, whether it be a snapshot or a case study, has come from a top of mind search. I've had to think about it, I've gone looking for it. If that's created a sense of trust and connectivity? Awesome. If this is now breaking that sense of trust, well, it's disclosure. I'm telling you that, as well as everything else, as well as being conscious of the parasocial, but because I'm also conscious of the parasocial, as I've been pulling back, I've been making certain that I am still just the disembodied voice of content. What you see on the screen here is Dr. Stephen Dan, PhD, university lecturer, voice of MKTG 2032, and now Head and Shoulders of MKTG 2032. Slightly modelled on Max Headroom in terms of, you'll note also the way I shape and frame myself. 
but I am a persona in a content block. The real variant of me, insofar as anyone is a real variant of themselves, the variant that is off screen is different, but no less authentic to the one that you have on here. This is the authentic academic self that you get to see because, look, I genuinely love I get excited about things. I genuinely love e-marketing. I genuinely love marketing as a professional area. I have bounced around, got overexcited about things and content. I think the internet is an amazing place. You, know, you hear me talk about augmented reality. I am just over the moon by how cool, how, how much future there is and how we haven't got there yet and how it's going to be shiny and amazing when we get there. That's... So the real academic self, that's who I am, that's what I do. So with knowing the parasocial theory behind, I have gone out of my way not to manipulate it. Uh, I'm conscious of it, I be I pull back when I think I'm getting too close to um, using it, but still at the same time, every example you get is something that I've looked at, assessed, judged and said, yeah, I'm prepared to put my, my face, my name and my words behind it. Because I'm versed in the marketing technique, the parasocial theory, and everything else to make certain we make it a space that you learn, it's about you, it's not about me, and you have a good time with it. But you do need to be aware that it is, at this point in semester, <sighs> the reason I'm raising it is I'm also pulling the plug on something. I'm just saying, if you have found a sense of connectivity disconnected from I haven't reacted to you or responded to you and you've got a sense of connectivity, look at this stuff and self-analyze. Look at this parasocial connection, say, how is my connection here? What is what is my parasocial connection to this subject and the content in this subject and to my other subjects and to my lecturers and to my whole university experience? Where Where is it at and am I happy with it? Because if you are, then you are, you're happy with it. You don't have to change anything. But if you're not happy with it, it might explain some of the things where it's like, oh, right, that makes sense. All right, as always, uh, the connections. There's a community aspect I want to just quickly raise here is the social media connections are done and are one-to-many to one because you're doing it on a public platform and I'm responding to you on a public platform. The sending something in the email is a private connection, but it's a dynamic two-way. Using my booking form is interesting because I respond to you from what you... You fill out a template and connect to me and I respond to you. So it's a one-to-one. -one. But it gives me the capacity to do a one-to-many-to-one. -one. A consultation, a booking to a Teams meeting, that's a one-to-one. -one. It's not held in public. It's, there's no connect there's no shared goods of value created for a public sphere compared to conversations at the back end of you get into uh, the zoom call when we wrap up on the end of the content and I hang around for a bit to chat to people and talk about stuff that is a one to many to one broadcast because there are people a when you are talking to me in that environment that is a place where we have an audience so even our choices in how we've kept the contact channels open, I've made certain that there's opportunity across public, private, one-to-many-to-one, -to -one, contained within our network, contained within our shared walls of our Zoom sessions, contained within our shared forums, but also spaces outside of that. If you're not comfortable within our forums, spaces outside of that. So all of this was a design decision around your lecturer knows quite a bit about how to set up a community and how to run a community and how to moderate and look after one and I've gone out of my way to try and create for you something that hopefully has been good hopefully you've benefited from it and this isn't pulling the rug from underneath you this is stepping back and saying hey to create these things you also put in an, you put in effort to make a community you need to expend effort and you have and take that with you into your next subjects. Take that with you into your next environments. If you're happy with what we've done here and you've had some fun with it, 
savor it, relish it, and then embrace it and get out there and build your own and create your own. Learn from what we've done. Be better than I am at it. Go and create cool things. And with that, signing off. Go be awesome, people. That's what uh, that's what this community, this whole show has been about. MKTG 2032. We set out to make something epic, and on the way through, we showed you the behind the scenes of how to make it, so you can go off and build your own and enjoy it, and maybe someday you get to run a show like this. I hope so. And to quote one of my favorite lines from Speed Racer, it's, someday I hope to be there to see it. <laughs>